Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from rainy Manila, where a few hours ago, Typhoon Rosita, or N Typhoon, landed up in the north of the Philippines. I am Edna Magigat from NTFP Asia, the Governance and Policy Advisor. Welcome to the Hive. The Hive is the NTFP EP learning uh, platform. Uh, so, you know, the bees use the beehive as their knowledge sharing system and also the place where they exchange information. So as an exchange program, NTFP strives to have this platform to inform, to be informed of current issues, discuss and exchange views on issues that really affect forest, indigenous people, community livelihoods, among others. So um, we have for today two speakers. One is coming from Chiang Mai. Uh, so that's Yumon from Myanmar. And the, the other one is Emi Primadonna from Indonesia. Before we start the webinar, let us first have some ground rules. Um, one, participants' microphones are muted throughout the sessions. If you have questions, please click. There's a click in your um, uh, interface. Click the raise your hand button. We will address your questions here um, orally, or we can send you a text reply. You can also maximize the chat box if you want to put in some comments or clarification. And lastly, the webinar for today, we will have 30 minutes of presentation. And after each speaker, we'll have a, a quick break, a quick, no, a quick um, Q&A. And then after that, a more, more time to discuss um, among, among all of us. Our topic for today is operationalizing the Paris Agreement, agreement looking at the key issues for forests and local communities and indigenous people. Our topic is very timely, one, because last October 8, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report saying that within the, the next 10 to 30 years, world temperature could rise by more than three degrees and this as we know um, per one degree Celsius of increase in world temperature is really very alarming for the planet for the people for plants and animals so it is expected that with that potential increase there will be more poverty and this poverty more poverty you would have extreme um, weather extreme weather occurrences such as uh, more typhoons increased droughts flash flood and sea level rise and among these that are really affected are vulnerable communities vulnerable people like indigenous people and forest communities that we work with okay second is that we will have the upcoming conference of parties to the unfcc and together with that uh, the meeting or the CMA, this is the shortcut. CMA is the shortcut for the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement. So it, this will be happening um, on December 2018 at uh, Katowice in Poland. Okay. So um, first we will have a brief overview of the Paris Agreement. So let me share my screen okay so this is just four slides okay let's see, let's see. i hope you can see okay can you see the screen slide share slide share okay okay it's okay so first an overview of the Paris Agreement. Um, so the Paris Agreement is actually the first universal international climate agreement that involves a commitment from all parties. Remember that we have a legally binding agreement, which was the Kyoto Protocol under also the same um, treaty, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, but it was only with developed countries. You know, you have commitment, to, to reduce emission. 
But under the Paris Agreement, all would have some commitment. Uh, so that's why we will have that explanation later about the commitment of the various parties in forest as well as engagement of non-state actor like indigenous people. So it was, sorry, I think I got this one. Sorry, the presentation should be this one. Okay, let me share the screen here. Okay. okay. So the Paris Agreement was adopted in Paris in December 12, 2018. Most of uh, the, the three of us, the, of the three of your speakers, were there in Paris in this very historical occasion. Uh, so just to make sure that this particular agreement would be binding as well as inclusive and effective as a climate change agreement, its effectivity would depend upon two occurrences. So one is that it will enter into force only. It will be effective once the ratification, acceptance, or approval but by at least 55 parties to the UNFCC. And this happened sometime in October uh, 2016. The second condition is that those parties that signed for the Paris Agreement, uh, their emissions would total into an estimated 55% of the total global GHG emission. Because of course, to be effective as a climate agreement, particularly going towards the target of reducing um, emissions and reducing the increase of the temperature, then at least 55% of the global emissions uh, of the country emitters are there. So this happened also sometime in um, October. So the, ent the entry into force of the agreement was 30 days after the two conditions were met. And this happened 30 days was in November 4, 2016. So we are actually on, on the second, on the second uh, year. And any party can actually, if they join, they can also withdraw. But the withdrawal can only take place, takes place after 30 minutes, uh, not 30 minutes, <laughs> after three years upon its uh, signing and uh, joining, and then one year thereafter. So the U.S. will have to go through this process if they intend to do that. So the first meeting of this, uh, for this particular convention, the CMA happened in um, Marrakesh, and then also in in Bonn and then this one. So they call it the CMA one to three. So it's actually three years for the first set of meetings. Okay. So what are the key elements of the Paris Agreement? I'm sure you are very familiar with some of this. So, you know, in a nutshell, I can say we have five uh, key elements. One is the national determined contribution. This will be further discussed by Emmy, uh, one of our very, very, a keen observer to the Paris Agreement and also monitoring forest. So the national determined contribution is actually the contribution of each party when they agree to be part of the, uh, the agreement. And this is a successive um, to be submitted every five years and each target will be a progression of the first one. Okay. The second one is actually the significant of the finance the, the the finance it's very important to note that the Paris agreement the the idea of finance was actually broadened into so the Paris agreement introduces a broader understanding of climate finance you know climate finance in the past before the Paris agreement was historically you know interpreted it limited to public financial flows from developed country to developing countries. With the target of the Paris Agreement, which the target was actually moving towards um, the stopping the increase of temperature well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to really stop this um, by 1.5 degrees, um, then the needed finance is really not only to billions, but actually trillions. So how did the Paris Agreement deal, deal with this? Um, it recognizes that every single finance, whether that's public, um, public uh, institutions, are very welcome. 
and there was this agreement of a collective mobilization goal of 100 billion US dollars per year from developed countries. It was agreed upon, but without mentioning the countries that would contribute to it. Aside from this, there's also being a part of the broader convention on the UNFCC, the financial mechanism of the UNFCC would also be supporting the Paris Agreement. So when you say about the financial entities of the uh, convention or its operation, operating entities, you have their, the Green Climate Fund, the Green in, uh, GGF, uh, Environment Fund, uh, the Adaptation Fund, and other things. So the second the third element is the five-year stock taking. So um, this would assist parties, scientific, at least, or was it the political commitment towards that goal? The fourth one is enhanced transparency. Okay. So this is actually better reporting, and this is one of the issues in um, up for further um, decisions in Katowice. Okay. So parties shall regularly provide inventory, national inventory part of their emissions. Um, of course, this is very technical, you know, by sources, by removals of their greenhouse gas. They, have, they should be prepared using method, good and good and this is usually um, being given by the IPCC. And then the information um, necessary to track their particular progress in implementing their contribution, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, all the information that they will be submitting with us will have to undergo technical um, review. So these are all some of the issues and then the obligation by countries towards enhanced transparency. The fifth one is actually the way the countries would be complying and monitoring each other. Um, the Paris Agreement uses, uses a facilitative approach, facilitative in nature, meaning, you know, it's encouraging and in a very diplomatic and, and very mindful way of ensuring um, and uh, what do you call this, fostering ambition. Um, it's non-adversarial, just in the Kyoto Protocol, if you don't meet the target, you have some, the countries would have some, um, some repercussions. And this is also um, non-punitive. Okay, so there are not sanctions. However, while it is facilitative um, in nature, there's also the challenge of being an environmental agreement. How do you actually facilitate compliance? Okay, that is why it's very important that the rule book the Paris rule book, which is actually modalities on the implementation of the Paris Agreement, would touch on how, how these approaches, while being facilitative in nature, would really foster compliance and ambition among parties. Okay. Aside from these key elements of the Paris Agreement, for us NGOs and development workers, Paris Agreement very promising because the preamble language includes provisions on gender equity, human rights, and intergenerational responsibility. So I think it's one of the first, one of the treaties you know, that has much of, of this promise and this concept of this, this rights, including human rights in, in, in a treaty. Um, and the last thing, it's actually a mix of bottom-up and top-down elements. What I mean by bottom-up elements, the countries would, you know, submit what they can base from or national determine their contribution, their way of uh, transparent reporting, etc. So that's like a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is that the parties agreed to a temperature goal. They agreed to a finance that is very important. It's quantified finance, and um, it's quantified into uh, billions of billions of dollars. And at the same time, they impose in this global stock take. 
So in a way, you see there's a balance of um, the sovereignty of each country, the right to determine their own development vis-a-vis -vis their climate change targets, as well as being a global agreement that deals with a very serious global issue, which is climate change, there's a need to have also a policing, a top-down approach. Okay. Now on my last two slides, which is how about the forest in the Paris Agreement? I see some of the, well, or OGENs are actually working on red plus, on community forestry. Forest in the Paris Agreement is, well, nothing new because forest and red plus has been discussed even before, um, even before Paris. Um, the decision on red plus is one of the most advanced and it was completed in Paris. Okay. So Article 5 in the Paris Agreement talks about parties to take action to conserve and enhance things and reservoir of greenhouse gases. Okay. So there is actually, for the first time in a treaty, a recognition of the role of forests as both a sink and, of course, as um, an emitter. Okay. The second part is the is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, which is actually red plus. Um, it was not spelled out there just to make sure that the branding would also be inclusive to others. You know, there, there could be um, just remission, uh, reducing emissions, etc. So, so red plus is, as most of you know, is a policy approach um, that is that is where developing countries can access positive incentives that could be money program, including results-based payments for reducing emissions from the forest sector in a manner that should be, of course, MRV, measured, reported, and verified. Okay. So the inclusion of the Red Plus in Article 5 is just telling the parties that, yes, we are recognizing that there are Red the red plus is also very important and um, the decision, the complete guidance of the UNFCC is already done. It is also a call to continue and hopefully scale up uh, the work that has been done on red plus. Okay. And we know that now the ball on red plus is in the country level, how these are being implemented and how how countries are actually demonstrating results um, through Red Plus. So the third one is this alternative policy approaches. I think Amy would also touch on this. Um, this is being alternative policy approaches because the main policy approaches is Red Plus. So alternative policy approaches is also called joint mitigation approaches. Is this is a way where there can there are support supporting conservation of forests, reducing emissions, but they are really not locked into the Red Plus um, scheme. Red Plus scheme is that you would have results-based payment. Here, countries say we want to access uh, payments, but on the first. We don't have to show our results. We can access payments before. So that's one of the, the discussion on the GMA. Um, the second discussion around GMA and these alternative policy approaches was also um, looking at, you know, the second policy, the first policy approach or the mainstream policy approach was carbon centric. But alternative policy approaches is we want to have a holistic or landscape view of reducing emissions. So that's why this term was actually put out there. But how it is implemented on the ground, etc. Well, I have yet to see that and I have yet to read about the fourth one is actually incentivizing non-carbon benefits. Um, that, you know, Red Plus was on carbon and safeguards also, but this was on non-carbon benefits. And uh, there has been, um, this is one of the last decisions that was made in Paris about Red Plus. Okay. And finally, um, my, this is my last slide. The success of this Paris Agreement would depend on key areas. Um, just a last speech why the Paris Agreement is very important. Okay. Um, 
we, to limit the temperature, we need really a massive, a big transformation that is actually unparalleled in human history. So this is the thing that we understand, we need to understand, and we have to support. And how do we support this? By understanding this and making sure our communities also understand this and contribute towards the goal of the Paris Agreement. Because ideally, you ha we have to stop the emissions by reaching high. And the turning point is 2020. From there on, we have to begin a rapid process of decarbonization. And that rapid process of decarbonization would entail a shift in investment, shift of thinking. And that is a major transformation. And key to that is first the rule book that will be decided on, on in COP24 and the Paris, the party's implementation of their NDC targets. Hopefully they would exceed that. And then third is better integration and uh, policy coherence of all international and domestic level um, country uh, uh, platforms, policies, engagement overall. So I hope friends, um, you get a view of the key elements of the Paris Agreement, what is at stake, and what is needed. So, do you have any questions so far? Okay. Questions? Why am I? Questions? Okay. If there are no questions, I... There is one question. I, I can't... Okay, sorry. There is one question. I will stop. I don't know how to stop. Okay. Okay. So there's a question. I wonder. So I'm just reading a question now. I wonder, based on the latest scientific study, how much is missing to keep warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius technically wise? Thank you for this question, Roger. Um, I think the target is at first at uh, 2 degrees at 1.5. Um, I, I, I cannot give you now the exact answer. It's, it's somewhere there. There's a, I think the IPCC has also uh, has that in the report. I can email it to you, Roger, and share it with you. Um, but it's really, I think it's gloomy. I don't think we can meet the target. That's one for sure. Um, I hope I, it, I, I, I answer your question, Roger. So we can share um, the latest IPCC report after this uh, webinar. So there's... Yes, we can check the IPCC report later. There's, it's actually very long, so you just read on the policy the policy brief, etc. Okay, now, so one of the key elements, I did not mention the one of the key elements is key elements of the Paris Agreement with regards to indigenous people is this local communities indigenous people platform. And I were very pleased and very happy to have this charming lady all the way from Myanmar, but right now is it Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. So Yumon is the program director of the Indigenous Peoples Development Program of the Chin Human Rights Organization. She has been very, very active in the LCIP platform, has monitored it since um, Bonn in COP23 when the discussion of the platform started. She is also the co-director of the Myanmar Indigenous Peoples Ethnic Nationalities Network, MIPEN and the Youth Representative and Executive Council member of the Asian Indigenous Peoples PAC, a very active member of the CSO Forum, so both CHIN and AIPP. So I'll give the floor to Yumon. So um, while Yumon is preparing to go on board, she is actually in a meeting in Chiang Mai. Okay. 
Yumon? Okay. So while waiting for Yumon, maybe we can entertain one more question. Okay. Uh, question. What is about the Paris rule book? Okay. So the Paris rule book, as I mentioned earlier, is, is like the implementing rules and regulation. It talks, it will discuss and the parties has to agree what is the modalities and then the arrangement of um, moving towards the goal as stated in the Paris Agreement. So sim simply put, it's just uh, a guidance and implementing rules and regulation for the Paris Agreement. Okay. So it's very crucial because the how-to, how do you actually report? How do you become transparent? How do we even get finance and how is the Paris Agreement, um, how is the CMA, which is that's the parties meeting to the Paris Agreement of the Paris Agreement, relates to the overall convention um, and how would the bodies operating entities of the convention would also support the, the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Rulebook is really very important. That's why even after um, the SAMSTA in June 2018, there was a special session in Bangkok, intersessional session in Bangkok, to really work on uh, the draft Paris rule. Okay. I hope I answered your question. Now, um, is human on board? Okay. Okay. Maybe while M while Yumon is not here, take uh, oh she was here earlier. <laughs> Let's go to Emmy. Emmy, thank you, Emmy. Emmy just landed in Indonesia from uh, somewhere. She's also a very busy person. So Emmy is um, the Red Plus project coordinator of the Indonesian Community Conservation Group (WRC). So Emmy has been working on community tenure rights and Red Plus since 2012. She really has an extensive knowledge on forest, carbon, on the ground, on national policies, and very active in the UNFCC COP discussion. She has been following the issues um, since Paris. As I mentioned earlier, we were all in Paris when Paris Agreement was adopted and had monitored the issues, particularly in forest indigenous people after that. So um, let's welcome Emmy. Thank you, Emmy, for joining us. And uh, that was really very eventful that your flight just landed. Emmy? Good, Ma. Yes. Can you speak louder? I can hear you, but I'm not sure everybody can hear you. Okay. So how about now? Is it okay? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Emmy. Maybe Dassel can share the, the presentation. I already sent on the on the screen. Can you see that? Yes. So we are now online, Emmy. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emmy. I'm from Indonesia. I would like to share you about some key issue regarding to the Paris Agreement and NDC, nationally determined contribution. So actually, this is a uh, almost similar with the presentation of Etna talking about what is the Paris Agreement and how it relates to NDC. So Paris Agreement basically a legally binding treaty with the United Nations of Convention of Climate Change. It has a it has a global temperature goals to limit uh, the increase of global temperature uh, to well below two degrees and then to limit the temperature increased to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then the third one, this is a, like a process <coughs> developing guidelines associated with the implementation of agree, uh, agreement. So after Paris Agreement, it doesn't mean that it stopped from that uh, stage, but uh, we have uh, to, to decide what kind of rule books of the agreement. So each of the parties know what are the rules on the Paris Agreement. And 
Now it also has been uh, discussed uh, with Edna about how uh, Paris Agreement relates to NDC. In Paris Agreements, uh, each country has like a bottom up approach and also top down approach. In a bottom up approach, approach, all countries has the commitment by their own to how to achieve the global temperature below two degree. And uh, NDC is part of the commitment each of the country, which, which uh, percentage they can reduce the emission and what targets they're going to achieve. And until now, 165 countries have submitted the NDC. Uh, however, maybe it relates to what Rogers asked. Uh, the current NDCs all over the world from 165 countries do not enough actually to achieve the temperature below two degrees. Uh, I just remember the, the, the report from the, the IP, uh, from, the, from the FAO saying that the current NDC will achieve the, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the temperature even three degrees. Uh, therefore, uh, on the process of uh, making the rules book, there's a kind of, uh, there's open chance for all the countries to revise or to reduce their NDC to achieve the, the greatest ambition of uh, climate change. Um, so what are the elements of the NDCs? Some countries, they put like a conditional and a unconditional target. Uh, conditionals mean that, uh, unconditionals mean this is their own effort how to reduce the target emission. For example, they are saying that we will able to reduce our em uh, 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 reduction, uh, reduction emissions by 17%, for example, by our own effort. However, there's still another chance for them to, to go beyond the target by giving like a conditional target where they, where they open for the international support to fulfill their target. This is the example like a Brazil, the RC, Colombia, Peru, Indonesia, and Myanmar. Like Indonesia, we have a target unconditional 29% but we can go beyond the 29% based on business as usual into 41% if we get the international target. However, like Myanmar, on their NDC day, they didn't say anything about the targets. They are just saying that we will protect the area system to 10% of total national land area. So basically, all the NDCs of the country now, they have a different version. One country saying that only mitigation, the other country saying that it's only adaptation and there's no means of, uh, means of the implementation for that. So that's why the Paris rule books also uh, clearly define what kind of the structure and the scope of the NDC. This is also the example of Indonesian's NDC. Uh, Indonesian's NDC is quite strong, I believe, because they clearly define the contribution each of the sector, such as energy, waste, IPPU, agriculture, and also forestry. And forestry and energy are the most significant reduction target among all the elements. LULUCF itself, it can 6% and energy sector reach 38% of emission reduction target in Indonesia. However, um, since the Paris rule books has not finished yet, the NDC is not final. There's still another uh, open second round for a revision to see how the countries also have the same commitment to raise the ambitions to get really the below two degrees Celsius based on the Paris Agreement. Uh, in this slide, I would like to tell you uh, how the process of negotiation at the international level is not as easy as like we have thinking in our mind. In, a, in the international negotiation, there's no consensus, there's no voting. Everyone should have their own uh, idea and everyone in the country should respect their, their idea. So uh, 
once country do not agree we cannot go through the uh, go through the negotiation text until everybody everyone in the countries agree on it so that's why it's very very difficult when developing countries say this developed countries saying this so that's why we i will say that the, the process to to design the rules book is a little bit uh, complicated and not very very easy for example in terms of ndc scope and the structure this is under the apa agenda 3 uh, in terms of feature and scope uh, between developed country and developing country and even among the developing country itself they have a different translation about what kind of features and scope should they uh, put it on the embassy such as whether this is only adaptation mitigation finance means of implementation or other matters so in the ndc rules book they will uh, they will uh, strongly uh, recommended that the features of the scope should be very very complete it's not only about adaptation it's, it's not only mitigation and regarding to the information uh, CTU is mean that how clarity of the information how transparency in the, in the information and how understanding the information it's also still not very clear the level of clarity and the level of transparency and understanding on the NDC and uh, regarding to the the accounting should we have a common guidelines guide, guidance regarding to the information so what kind of info, information needed for is it still under discussion until the cop 24 uh, this year regarding the accounting also uh, accountings mean that when the ndc's uh, the ndc should uh, uh, saying about accounting to make sure the tracking progress toward the action each of the country um, uh, like a kyoto protocol kyoto protocol uh, kyoto protocol very very clear before uh, before before kita divide which one is the flop country and what is the rules of the flop country and what the rules of the flopping country in a paris agreement similar almost more and less a similar because a uh, developed country can say something about accounting very very detailed very very high technology but developing country who has very less capacity to do that they will saying that it should be cbdr common but different responsibility between the flop and the flopping countries and then should it should it also quantifiable accounting or only quantify and also they should uh, pre uh, account what kind how much is the financial support provided by the flop country to the flopping country to achieve their target ndc this is also regarding the the finance so far the text of the finance is a uh, quite progress right now but there's still two elements uh, issue whether they should a process a set new collective goal on climate finance for post 2025 where the flop country said there's no need for that and then the second one where the the to the uh, whether to develop modalities for ex anti climate finance to begin under the article 6.5 whether there's, there's any rules saying that information should be given which developed country also refused saying that how much money do you will prepare and the flopping country said we will do what how much money based on the money that you given but the flop can uh, the flopping uh, the flop country saying no you did something well then we will support the money this is like a uh, like the issue under the the finance uh, and then after that uh, where is the position of red like Edna be uh, saying before the position of red is on article 5 it's already clear this is on the article 5 however there's another chance for the red it's not only in the article 5 of the Paris agreement but also in the article 6 telling about market and non-market approach basically the article 6 is like a, a low higher ambitions over the NDC for all the countries all over the world so this is also giving in incentive for progressing beyond the NDC in the article 6 this it should be beyond the NDC when you already achieve your target under the NDC so you can go on the article 6 
on the market and non-market approach. But if you not finish your MDC, you cannot go on the Article 6. Uh, like I said before, uh, since the uh, the ambitions of the NDC is very low, so the Article Six is like a like a what is it? Like a, a leverage to 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 erase, erasing the target over uh, over uh, to achieve the uh, uh, to limit below two degree. Basically, Article Six is voluntary. The countries can go on the Article Six, and they cannot go. That's voluntary uh, basis. And also the Article 6 provide support for developing countries in terms of finance, capacity building, and also technology. So this is also opportunity for developing countries to get goals beyond NDC by getting more on finance, more on capacity building, and more on technologies transfer. And the principle of Article 6 is divided into three sessions. The first one is about 6.2, International Transfer for Mitigation Outcomes. It means that among the country, between the country, they can transfer their target of reduction emission to the other country based on the payment. So this is 6.2, 6.4, it's all about the market. And the second uh, 6.4 is, uh, this is like an additionality. If you can pr promote mitigation greenhouse gas emission and fostering sustainable development, so you will get another uh, additionality in terms of promote sustainable development and also for poverty eradication. And uh, in 6.8, it's basically non-market approach. It's like a joint mechanism adaptation and sustainable development among the, the country. Uh, this is based on payment, based on climate finance. This is not payment based on performance, but payment based on climate finance. So one, uh, when the climate finance provide, how much money you can, how much uh, effort you can do to target beyond your NDC. However, on at the international level, there kind of in uh, there kind of issue whether they uh, they put CDM or REDD under the Article 6. Like Indonesia, we favor on the REDD. We are not really agree that CDM put it on this uh, article because uh, so, uh, some, uh, we uh, based on the experience, exper uh, experience before that, the CDM is not really uh, working well uh, in terms of the, the, the project. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really uh, touch the issue for the reduction emissions. It's only like a very technological and very te uh, transfer of uh, the, the knowledge and capacity building. Uh, CSO calls, uh, they, uh, CSO calls at the international levels. If we go to article six, make sure that uh, accounting rules is very, very strict. We don't want to do the offset under the Article 6. And it should be out of the NDC's target. Uh, in terms of global stock tick, I think it's already reviewed by Aetna. Uh, once the country commitment, doing commitment on NDC, and they will implement the NDC, so the global stock uh, stock tick uh, we'll see that how the collective progress toward achieving the purpose will be achieved, how the progress toward uh, this target achieved, and it has been, it will be done every five years. Um, I think the outcome is also used to input for new NDC for member states, and then the five years review will also evaluate adaptation, climate finance provision, and technology development and transfer. Uh, I think that's all about my presentation. I will open the floor for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmy, for that presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Emmy. So there is one question so far here. 
Um, you mentioned about NDC and about the 165 countries. Is there available document that summarizes the NDC of 165 countries and relate these to the warming target or to the latest IPCC scientific panel report? Okay. I think uh, there's a the report saying that the current NDC uh, is not really achieving uh, the Paris Agreement. Even it make a, a global warming into three degrees Celsius. But I forgot the, the report. I will search on it and I will be very happy to distribute you. Okay. Well, yeah. um, there, there are also there are also a number of platforms, uh, digital pl uh, online platforms. Oh, yeah. Tracks this, mm -hmm. like a DEI is doing this. Um, yes, so yes, as yes. It admits, so there is also the climate trackers. So there are platforms. What we can do yeah. after the yeah. webinar is to actually send the list of these platforms that you can check the progress of the NDC vis-a-vis -vis the 1.5 to 2 degrees and the 3 degrees uh, warming as uh, predicted by the IPCC. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Okay. So there is another question here, Emmy, is about um, uh, the Paris rule book. Um, yes. Um, so far, uh, there have been discussion of how NGOs and non-state actors are relating or will be implementing the Paris Agreement. What were the role? How is it being discussed or not discussed at all in the Paris rule book discussion? Um, actually, on the Paris rule book discussion, uh, they are not discussed yet uh, in terms of the, uh, the operationalization of NDC. But on the Article 6, they discuss about how the, uh, the, the roles of non-state actors can contribute to raising the ambitions beyond the NDC, especially on the Article 6.2, 6.4 about market approach. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So there's another question. I... Okay, how many... Okay, when is the second revision of the NDC? And the next question is, I can see, how many article is voluntary? When is the second revision of the NDC and how many articles are voluntary? I will ask Emmy to answer and then I will also answer. Yeah, uh, the, the first one, the Paris rule book should be finished first. And after that, you can, uh, every country will have the second revision for that. Uh, it hope that by COP24, uh, the Paris rule books will finalize, but we are not sure yet because based on the discussion last uh, sub meeting in Bangkok, there's so many heating issue regarding to what should be agree, what should be put on the text, what are not put on the text. So basically all the text still on the brackets, not finalized yet. And once the, the Paris rule book finished on the COP24, there's still another chance for the country to revise their, their NDC uh, uh, until 2019. Because I believe by 2020, they have been started uh, working on their NDC. That's okay. the first question. And the second question regarding to the, the what is the second question about market? Yeah. How many articles are voluntary? How many articles okay. is voluntary? Uh, basically, NDC is not legally binding. Yeah, this is not legally binding. This is commitment. Uh, so, uh, NDC actually, to be honest, this is a uh, voluntary. Whether they want to achieve their uh, commitment, whether they're not, but of course, because they are saying this is commitment, they should implement it. Regarding to the, the, the what article saying about the voluntary, basically it's only on the article 6 saying about market and non-market approach. Mm, that things that I know. Maybe, Edna, if you have anything to say, you can add. Yeah, okay. Um, so, for the different parts of the provisions, articles in the Paris Agreement have different uh, 
legal characteristics. Some of them are legally binding. Some of them yeah. are just voluntary. But I cannot really like uh, count, I can I did not count the article. Maybe uh, yeah. I did a presentation that I can send. Um, yeah. Just this one question for all, all the panelists. I, I would read this, but this can be answered after uh, the presentation of human. So, what yeah. is the status of women participation in the upcoming COP? And what about the Indigenous Women Participation Platform to address traditional knowledge and skills of Indigenous women? It's a very good question, but I think we'll answer that as a first question during the Q&A round. Thank you very much, Emmy. Uh, please yeah. stay for the uh, uh, Q&A later. I will now call on Yumon. Yumon, I have introduced Yumon a, a while ago. Yumon, I hope the line will hold. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Yumon. Hello. I'll give the floor to you now. Um, so, can I just... Yeah, you can proceed now. presentation from here? Yeah, share screen. Uh, I'm it's, sorry. it's down, the bottom down. Share. Share screen. And then your screen should be in a slideshow, your PowerPoint is slideshow. We can all see it after that. Oh. Okay. Can you put it on slideshow? Slide view? Yeah. Does it work? Is it working? Yes, it is working. Thank you. Now you may uh, do yeah. your presentation. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maitin Yumon. I work for a human rights organization, and uh, I'll be talking about local communities and indigenous peoples platform. So, uh, what is local communities and indigenous peoples platform? For those who have been uh, following uh, the climate change negotiations, there are nine. Um, Yes, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, uh, we can say that it is uh, the outcome um, of the efforts made by International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. The indigenous peoples, leaders who have been engaging in the climate change process in the negotiations and um, who have been trying a lot to advocate for indigenous peoples. So currently there are nine um, there are nine constituencies uh, who are observers at the uh, UNFCCC and indigenous peoples organizations as one of the constituencies. And so how do these uh, indigenous peoples organizations engage is uh, through International Indigenous Peoples Forum for Climate Change, which was established in 2008. So as you are already aware, it is always, it has always been very uh, challenging in the space for engagement, uh, to engage with the parties was really um, limited. Um, so uh, this indi uh, indigenous local communities and indigenous people's platform. So I will just call it LSIP. Uh, so the, this LSIP platform uh, is, a door um, to let us uh, participate more effectively in the uh, and raise our issues in the climate change negotiations. Um, so, uh, in a COP twenty one, uh, the ELSI platform was established at COP twenty one, and here I'm showing the decision text, uh, uh, paragraph one thirty five. Uh, it mentioned and established uh, the conference of parties recognizes the need to strengthen knowledge. So here they are talking about the traditional knowledge, uh, technologies and practices of indigenous peoples. And then this uh, leads to the establishment of the LC platform. Um, yes. Um, so what are the purposes of the platform? So the first one is to strengthen the knowledge, technologies, practices, and efforts of local communities and indigenous peoples uh, related to addressing and responding to climate change. Uh, so through this platform, this knowledge and practices will be um, strengthened. And the other one is 
so the knowledge will be strengthened and the other one is to facilitate the exchange of experience because different indigenous communities and different local communities have uh, different practices uh, both for adaptation and mitigation so uh, this uh, this platform will facilitate uh, the exchange of all these experiences uh, in the best way and the other one is to enhance the engagement of local communities and indigenous peoples in the UNF triple C processes so like I mentioned and uh, it has always been very uh, challenging and it, it became better. It, uh, there has been progress a lot and uh, this platform will surely enhance the engagement uh, the, with the parties and then in the negotiation process. Um, so there are three key functions of the platform. The first one is on knowledge. The second one is capacity for engagement, and the third one is climate change policies and actions. So let me elaborate a little bit more on it. Um, so when we talk about the knowledge, uh, so uh, it includes all the knowledges that in different indigenous communities and look, uh, sorry, different indigenous peoples and local communities have been practicing. And we also call them technologies, practices. Uh, so this platform, uh, will promote uh, all these practices to exchange these practices and the knowledge and the technologies that we have. And also the other one is uh, taking into account the free prior informed consent of the holders of such knowledge, innovations and practices. So this also gives uh, indigenous peoples not only to a chance to promote and but also to protect the knowledge that we already have and um, to, yeah, to, to protect uh, the knowledge uh, so that they are not misused or abused. And uh, the other one is for capacity for engagement. So we cannot just say, okay, come and engage, uh, but uh, we need strategic uh, way of engagement. And also, as we, as we are already aware, uh, the how to engage through this whole process is really complicated and uh, indigenous peoples also need uh, capacity building and not only on the part of indigenous peoples but also on the part of the parties and other relevant stakeholders so that uh, they can have a better understanding on how to engage effectively with the indigenous peoples with the knowledge holders and yeah so that both parties can uh, benefit. Um, and the other one is um, climate change policies and actions. Um, so um, this knowledge will be integrated uh, in, in, in different ways, uh, in a more effective uh, manner by uh, these climate change policies and actions. Um, so uh, these actions, when, uh, when they even go to country levels, uh, it is really important that uh, these policies and climate change actions reflect the needs and the rights of indigenous peoples then yeah um, so uh, one uh, one significant uh, achievement uh, we would say was uh, that the, the agreement made uh, during uh, cop 23 and uh, in the in decision two, in paragraph eight, it mentions about the principles. It reflects uh, the principles that indigenous peoples proposed. So for all these decision texts, different uh, processes, uh, they follow different processes, including uh, informal dialogues and informal meetings and formal meetings. And uh, this text reflects, for example, like the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples and equal status of indigenous peoples and parties when we really engage in this platform. And uh, including in leadership roles, self-selection of indigenous peoples representatives. Um, so this is really important. These uh, these uh, principles are really important for meaningful participation and engagement of indigenous peoples. So, yeah, this was good uh, uh, sort of success, we would say. Um, so, uh, this is not like a boom, 
sort of uh, product, a uh, one-time product, but uh, there were several meetings after COP21. Uh, um, so two official dialogues were held and four uh, informal uh, dialogues were held. So the two official dialogues were held at uh, the first one at Substa 46 in May 2017 and uh, the other one during Substa 47 in November 2017 during COP23. And yeah, one thing that we are proud of as Asians is that uh, during the first uh, official dialogue, uh, the co-moderator uh, of that uh, official meeting was um, an Asian, uh, uh, Miss uh, Grace Balawak from the Philippines. So we are really proud of that, uh, that uh, we Asians are making, um, having a leading role in uh, playing a very important role in the negotiations with the, uh, with the state parties. And uh, four informal dialogues were held, the first one in Brussels, um, yeah, the time is mentioned here uh, on the slide. Uh, Canada, Finland, and the last one it was in Bolivia uh, just very recently in October uh, 11th to 13th in 2018. Uh, so this, uh, these informal dialogues hold uh, a very important, uh, play a very important role for uh, really building uh, understandings between uh, indigenous peoples and the state parties. Uh, and why are we demanding this point, that point, and also why they, of course, they already acknowledge that they need to, uh, they are willing to uh, accept uh, the, the importance, uh, uh, they already acknowledge the importance of the role of traditional knowledge and uh, to be contributed by local communities and indigenous peoples. But when this platform will be operating, how this will operate and how we will be engaging so that these informal dialogues hold uh, places for trust building processes. So they are really important. And one good thing is also that uh, as they are informal, uh, all the parties are really uh, flexible and open uh, when uh, discussing and when in, in the process of the dialogue. Um, and this, these also show the commitment of the state parties and uh, their interest and their commitment in the operationalizing of this platform. Um, so the one in Bolivia was the last one and it was held in Cochabamba. I would, uh, because as it is the last one, I would like to reflect a lot on uh, a little bit uh, on it. So um, it was called Informal Tinku Meeting of Indigenous Peoples and Friendly States on Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform under the UNFCCC framework. So it was held in Cochabamba and who were there? Uh, the UNF Triple C Secretariat, Substar Chair Representatives uh, via Campesina members from Peru, Colombia and Bolivia. They were sent by the Substar Chair. They represented, and we had uh, quite a number of parties uh, engaging in the in the meeting uh, from Bolivia, Canada, European Union, Indonesia, China, Mexico, and Bolivian Congress and Senate also. And we had Indigenous Peoples representatives from Asia, Africa, Pacific, North, Central, and South America. So, as uh, as all of the informal meetings uh, are practice, um, Chatham House rule, uh, that we cannot really uh, share on details information on what was discussed, but uh, there was agreement among indigenous peoples where we also uh, had a chance to sit together and brainstorm what we really want out of this uh, coming COP24. Uh, so the first one uh, that we are expecting is that the facilitative working group uh, will be established from this uh, COP24. So this facilitative working group will be the one who will be who will carry all the uh, the implementation of the work plan of this uh, local uh, this LCEP platform. So in from indigenous peoples' perspective, uh, it should be comprised of. Uh, 
indigenous peoples representatives, local communities representatives, and also state parties who are uh, who will represent the, the parties. And um, also, uh, we are demanding that uh, the UNF oh, that we have as uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, we would like to have a focal point at the UNF Triple C uh, for the realization of the platform because the implementation will take so many steps and so much workload. So we we will need uh, sort of someone who will be working fully on that and who will be engaging with us on the progress um, from the UNF Triple C side. And also as the uh, effective, as we are all, all of us are aware, uh, funding is a very big issue in the implementation of the the work plan. Uh, so, in this LC platform is not really sort of a thing that will be like hanging up in the air, like uh, at at the UN body, but it is more like uh, we perceive this more as a uh, uh, where. Uh, as a space where uh, local communities and indigenous peoples representatives will have uh, a chance to engage at different levels. So this will even need uh, like a more, much, much bigger funding and more creative activities that will enable uh, these local communities and indigenous peoples to engage at different levels. So funding is also a big issue that we are uh, discussing. So, uh, I myself, I participated in uh, informal informal meetings and also during the multi-stakeholder uh, official um, dialogue. Um, so, the, and uh, those during those meetings, what uh, I myself raised a lot is was uh, the participation of indigenous women and the participation of indigenous youth at different levels is really important and the work plan for uh, this uh, LC platform should reflect uh, the important roles of Indigenous women and youth at different levels. Um, so uh, we cannot just be talking at the UN level, but uh, this need to be reflected uh, at different levels. Hello, Yumon. Hello, Yumon. Can you hear me? So I think um, Yumon's signal was really unstable at the very start. I think he she's on the last stage of her presentation. Um, in the meantime, because there are actually questions directed to her. Yumon? Can you unmute? Okay. So, okay. Okay. So, um, in the meantime, I think we have to end the presentation and we'll now have the question and answer. Uh, Emmy, there is one question here earlier about. Um, hello? Yes. Okay, you want. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You want is back. So, was it the last stage of your presentation or last slide? Yeah, last slide. Yeah. Okay. So maybe last words, last slide, and last words from you one, and then we go for a Q and A. Oh, okay. So, uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so what? Um, well, uh, what is really important here is for. Uh, to be really engaged uh, from different levels, from the ground by indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, uh, to the to the UN. Um, yes, yeah, I think that's all from my side. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Emmy and then Newman. There are a number of questions here, and I think we'll just have a uh, maybe ten minutes maximum, so we can end now. Um, we can end after that. First questions, the one is actually first on um, meaningful participation of indigenous women. Oh. Okay, wait, wait, sorry. 
There were actually like 10 questions. Let me go to the first one. What is the status of women participation in the upcoming COP? And what about indigenous women participation platform to address traditional knowledge and skills of indigenous women? So specifically on women participation in COP and their platform. Um, Yumon? Yes. Um, yes, uh, thank you for your questions. And so uh, for indigenous women, as uh, I'm sure you, um, you are, sorry. Um, okay, it's not mentioned here. Um, okay, sorry. So I will just, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because my con connection is always interrupted. So, um, yes, uh, for indigenous women, uh, there is no such uh, sort of indigenous women platform uh, for engagement. But uh, like I mentioned, we have side events. Uh, we uh, like we arrange uh, side events and also statements by those who attend. Uh, uh, indigenous women who it's uh, who are engaging in, in in the process so the, it's not like a, such kind of indigenous women uh, formal platform but uh, those who the indigenous women who are engaging in the process uh, are always very much active in the side events and also making statements so that uh, uh, these indigenous uh, women voices are reflected uh, in the discussions and also there is a um, uh, gender constituency uh, in the, among the nine constituencies, uh, there is the gender uh, and women constituency. So that, that is also a, a really big force in pushing, uh, pushing uh, the gender policy uh, for, uh, forward. Uh, so I, I'm sure you're aware of that, uh, that the gender policy was adopted. Um, Oh, sorry, gender action plan. Gender action plan. So uh, also in the gender working group, gender and women working group, indigenous women are a part of uh, that working group. And uh, every morning uh, th uh, they have this uh, women caucus. So uh, when they talk about women, they also try to include the indigenous women voices. Uh, so this is uh, the different... Uh, spaces that we engage uh, for the indigenous women. Yes. Okay. And so, for the COP24, um, so, yes, sorry. No, yeah, go ahead. Hello? Yes, human, go ahead. You were saying in COP24. Oh, okay. Yes, in uh, COP24, uh, we are, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of how many indigenous women participants will be able to be there. But for example, from my organization, we are going to present the role of uh, indigenous women for sustainable forest management based on the research that we conducted. So different uh, communities uh, also present, they bring the, the uh, the materials uh, regarding uh, relating to indigenous women. So you are also very much welcome to uh, submit your concern and uh, the the points that you would like us to raise because the IIPFCC International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change is there to represent yes us. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is also a related question to the LCIP. How are local communities and indigenous people relate to the NGOs in the platform? Okay. Right, right, right. So because uh, uh, there could be really uh, this junk, you know, this joint between all these NGOs representing IPs and communities to the actual IPs and communities. Um, so, um, sorry, uh, the, the question is about how we communicate with other uh, other eight constituencies, is it? Is it the question? How local communities and IPs can relate to the NGOs that are being that uh, in, in this engage in this platform? Uh, the, right, right. So, uh, what we are trying to push is uh, that to operationalize this platform from the UN until the very uh, 
community uh, on the ground. So there will be like different levels of engagement where indigenous peoples and also local communities can engage. Uh, and the other way uh, is also our engagement at the UN itself. Uh, so you are talking about the nine constituencies also. So the nine other eight constituencies, we, uh, how should I say, uh, when the youth, young girls are the, the, NG, uh, the representatives who are working for uh, youth and they're also like Ingo, uh, Bingo business and uh, other investment people and also researchers, Ringos. So these constituencies, when they raise their concerns, they also try to include indigenous uh, people's voices. So this requires us also to go and talk to them to raise the points that we, uh, we want them to raise. So this is how we help out each other, but sometimes indigenous peoples, for indigenous peoples, we have to speak like twice as much as other groups so that we are heard, yeah. Okay, so, um, us okay, usually in this q and I, I would let the speaker you know, ask the question, and I mean, I would let the one asking the question speak out loud, but with the unstable connection, I'm just reading it. So I think last on the women's participation is actually um, from Kamala regarding the funding, indigenous women's organization could not approach participation in the funding. Do you have any tips for them and how indigenous women organization can actually have funding to participate in the COP or in the LCIP? Uh, right. Uh, yes, funding is always a, yes, a big issue for all of us. So this, this is what we are trying to, trying to promote. And yes, I also mentioned during my presentation that funding should be allocated enough enough adequate funding should be allocated for all these different communities to be able to engage effectively starting from the ground local local very local to the UN and also uh, please feel free to write to us because if they have really good cases to present uh, during the COP because we have side events where uh, also this year we are going to have a side event as uh, members of AIPP, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, we are going to organize a side event on indigenous women's role in climate change response. So uh, please feel free to connect these groups to us and we will also try to uh, mobilize the resources and also we can carry the cases. And if we have adequate funding, of course, we'll be very happy to bring these uh, representatives to, to the COP, yes. Okay. Thank you. There is a question that is uh, actually on the, still on the IP representation. It's not the special rapporteur or IP, this is the UN special rapporteur IP, oh. representing oh, okay. the UNFCC. So uh, I think a right. distinction between the two, um, human can be given. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, well, the role of the mandate of special rapporteur on indigenous peoples is uh, it's more general on the rights of uh, indigenous peoples. Um, but uh, here what we are talking about, the focal point is a staff within the UNFCCC who we can always contact to ask for the update because this will be like a full-time mm -hmm. work. Um, but uh, the special rapporteur always supports our voice and she also joined, she was there during the uh, official dialogue, uh, both, uh, both official dialogues, she was there and also she raised uh, the issues for all the indigenous peoples across the globe. Uh, yes, she was there and she also gives us support where, wherever she can. But uh, like I mentioned, we still need, a, uh, it's, a, it's a different one. It's a staff within yeah. the UNFCCC fully working. Yes. Okay. So um, there is last two questions, no? How is the role of the local communities in the platform since they don't have a constituency under the convention? So um, when you say LCIP, the local communities also refer to IPs or are you referring to local communities in general? And how is this constituency really represented at the platform? Right, right. 
So uh, local communities actually, uh, there were a few representatives, uh, but the indigenous peoples, we have also been like organizing ourselves since 2000, um, since two, sorry, <laughs> um, since 2008. So, uh, but local communities, they, so far we haven't heard any sort of formal uh, platform that they organize themselves for the engagement in, the, in this process. Uh, sometimes they show up individually, but uh, there hasn't been any sort of significant uh, participation in the discussions yet. And uh, states, uh, some parties are also considering that, that fact a lot, but we are indigenous people, so um, we are not really mandated to <laughs> speak on behalf of local communities. So yes, but um, uh, I, I hope we, uh, they will also, once the platform is established, they will also orga uh, organize themselves better and yes, engage in the, in the process, yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I will give Hello. Um, each speaker. Thank you very much, Yungun. I will give each speaker one minute for their last message, starting with Emmy. Um, Emmy, um, any parting words for our uh, participants? Um, I will say that uh, there will be chance for all over the countries to achieve the Paris Agreement if they are really uh, have a good will to do that. Uh, all the space has been open, including the financial support, capacity, uh, capacity building support, and also means of uh, implementation has been open. Uh, but again, when the, the rules book get into political way, it's really, really difficult to implement it because each of the country sometimes wait and see. You will do, I will do. But if you don't do, I will not do. So it really, really need a strong commitment to implement the NDC. And the second thing about the market and non-market approach. Uh, market and non-market approach is only the additionality. I will say this is like a bonus if you have already achieved your NDC. But the most important things that you did, your, you do the NDC, then I can, you can go to the, the other uh, the other, uh, what is it? Uh, the other, the other Article Six to get more ambitious level. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmy. So, um, you want for your last message? Um, yes. As uh, starting from now, we'll be preparing a lot uh, for ourselves and to be able to. Um, I push to the direction that we'd like to uh, at COP24. So uh, please be with us and also please send your concerns and concerns so that we can include those uh, in our uh, in the negotiations. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very thank you very much to our speakers from uh, Myanmar and Indonesia. So. Um, there will be a second part of this webinar, which is actually or post COP24. This will be on the second week of January. So please stay tuned for our next webinar. And hopefully, and I'm sure that time, the Paris rule book has been decided. And we'll talk about more concrete steps of how the parties how the parties and how the CFP engage can also engage in the LCIP and contribute to the uh, uh, operationalizing the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. much. As and a as a last word, I would like to thank my Hive team, Dazza, and Yana, Yana, and Yana for uh, preparing for this session. Thank you very much and have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you.